Um, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Um, we're going we're gonna to go over the topic of when we all get to heaven. Um, and as I said before, this is for the Grace School of the Bible, the summer conference, the seminars. Uh, I was supposed to do one of the seminars, but I've been asked to do um, speak in another one of the sessions. So Brother Jordan asked me to record this and then take it back to them on DVD. Uh, so they can make it part of that without me having to do all those, all the teachings up there. So Ephesians chapter 1, <clears throat> we're going to talk about when we all get to heaven, what it's like, uh, what it looks like, what do we, what do we expect to see. Uh, we're going to be able to talk about the fact that um, who's there, what's there, uh, what are we going to do there, are we going to be able to recognize people, and things like that. So we're going to start off real the real reason that we want to make sure that we know this is why is it important is because we have something that we're going to do and we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. But the reason that we want to know something about when we all get to heaven, what's taking place in heavenly places is Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Ephesians 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. May we take the information. Um, it may be kind of light and, and fun to be able to think about what we're going to do, what we're going to see, uh, the fact that we're not going to be surprised by some of the things that we see in those heavenly places. Um, because we're already kind of familiar with them. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. We thank you for, we're thankful for this day. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. So, <clears throat> why is it important for us to know what's going to take place when we all get to heaven? All right. so one of the first things, and I didn't mention this before, but one of the first things that we need to talk about is we're not going to be up on a, sitting on a cloud playing harps. Right, I know. Um, <clears throat> I know that's kind of weird to think about, and something else that I'd kind of forgot about before. <clears throat> and some people might get this, and some people don't. Um, so we were watching Golden Girls a few nights ago. Yeah, that show. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I am old. So we're we're watching we're watching Golden Girls, and it was one of the times where. Uh, Sophia dies and then she sees her dead husband in heaven. So she goes to heaven. She does all that stuff. Um, she's talking. She's talking to her husband. He says, "You know, everybody thinks that heaven's up there, but it's actually up and to the left." It's just that's one of those things. But the thing about it is, you know, you kind of bring that up. It doesn't really make any sense. But here, here's the deal with heaven. The the one thing that we need to make sure that we know is it is a it is a place, right? It has a location and all that. <clears throat> um, there's, there's a place that we're going to go one day. And right now we can see, according to Ephesians 1.3, we see that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all, with all spiritual blessings. Where are those spiritual blessings? Well, they're in heaven, heavenly places, in Christ, in Christ. According as he hath chosen us before him, or before the foundation of the world, that we should be to the, be holy and without blame before Him in love. The idea that, that what, what He's dealing with here is He's talking about before the foundation of the world, way back here in eternity past. I'll put this. Eternity past, God had a plan. God had a plan for the heaven. All right? And so what's taking place is God has a plan for the what's going to take place in the heavens way out here in the ages to come. Right? And the great part about it is, is we get to be a part of it. Right? So way back here in eternity past, God had a plan for the heavens out there in the future and the ages to come. But we also know that he had a plan for the earth in the ages to come as well. All right? And that's one of those things that we kind of see as, as, as we look at some of this information. Drop down to, 
Drop down to verse verse 9 real quick. <clears throat> In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, it says, Having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure which He hath purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ. What are those all things that he's talking about? What's he say? Both which are in heaven and which are in earth, right? So there's something that God has chosen to do before the foundation of the world that He was going to do something with the heaven and the earth and He's going to reconcile them both into one thing, gather them together in one, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. That's the issue. God has something that He's doing. Drop down to verse, um, verse 19 real quick. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. When we take a look at this, notice, <clears throat> And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward who believe according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him in His own right hand in the heavenly places. Where do we know that Christ is right now? Heavenly places. Where was He at one particular time? He was here on earth and He was walking around, right? Ministering to the nation of Israel. We know that he, according to Romans 15, 8, he was what? A minister of the circumcision. Was a minister of the circumcision. Not has become, like some versions of the Bible change it to, but he was a minister to the circumcision. Right? Um, let's do this real quick. <clears throat> Go get... Look at Job 38. Job 38. Start off in, we'll start off in verse... Start off in verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird, now, gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, thou hast un declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof? If thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon, uh, stretched the line upon it? Whereupon the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as it had issued out of the womb? As if it had issued out of the womb. When I made the cloud the garment thereof, and the thickness, thick darkness... A swaddling band for it. And he's going down through here. He's talking about creating the foundation of the earth. Creating the earth. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. We'll get these real quick because we want to make sure that we see this. The, the issue here is that the reason that we need to know this stuff is God's going to do something in the heavens and God's going to do something in the earth in the ages to come to glorify His Son. Right? And so that's one of the things that we, we want to make sure that we see. God, before the foundation of the world, had a plan. He's going to perform that plan until both of those things take place. Um, Genesis chapter 1. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1, notice verse 1. In the beginning God created thee what? Heaven and not heavens, right? We're going to talk about that in just a second. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, when, when I talk about before the foundation of the world, that was before these things took place. God had a plan that He was going to do something with this heaven and with this earth way out there, right? And so that's one of those things, and, and Bruce pointed out, and I'm glad he did, that's heaven, singular, not heavens, plural. In other versions of the Bible, it does change that to heavens. 
in Genesis 1.1. And there's some reasons why they do that. But notice he says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And do you know what he does from this time all the way up until he gets to the Apostle Paul is God is talking about and dealing with what he's going to do in the earth. In fact, he tells Abraham, he's going to, he says, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you a piece of land on the earth that your seed is going to do some things with, and I'm going to bless the world through your seed. Where? In the earth. Right? When Jesus Christ teaches, teaches the folks to pray, what do they say? Their prayer is what? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Come on, guys. You can still talk. It's okay. <clears throat> right? Their, their deal is earth. Right? Not until you come to the Apostle Paul do you, far, do you start finding out about some things about heaven, what God's doing in the heaven. So one of the things that we want to make sure is, since you brought that up, Bruce, go over to Genesis chapter 2. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 2. So here we are in Genesis 1 1. We get over here to Genesis 2 1. Notice what happens. <clears throat> Genesis 2 1 says, Thus the heavens, plural, right? Notice he says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. All of a sudden we've got an S there. A long, long time ago at our old church where we used to go, uh, we were having a conference, and I think it was Doug Dodd came up from Florida, and this is what he was talking about. He was talking about something else, but he brought this, brought this up. There was a Mennonite pastor in in the congregation that night and he went up to him he says I've never ever ever seen that S and that didn't have an S he was an old he was an older gentleman probably in his 70s or 80s probably um, he's been preaching for years in a Mennonite church and he from the King James Bible he said I never noticed that heaven and heavens and he's like, now I'm going to have to go and read my Bible in a completely different way. Because things matter. The stuff on the page matters. Letters matter, which is why we care about the King James Bible. Which is why we make an issue about that. Which is why people think that we're lunatics. But that's fine. We know that we have the very Word of God before us. That we can have it in our hands. And we know that we're going to be judged by that Word one day. And not by one of those other versions. So, what happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 2-1? Well, there were some things that, that we find out <clears throat> that we go from one heaven to multiple heavens. Well, how many heavens are there? Well, let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and I've, I've kind of thought about this before. Do we really know how many heavens there are? No, but we know that there's at least a certain number. Now, there could be more, but we know that there's at least a certain number because of what 2 Corinthians chapter 12 tells us. One thing is we know that there's not one, but there's at least two or more because he gives us a plural there in Genesis 2, 1. So notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Start off in verse 1. It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory... I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the, what? Third heaven. So we know that there's at least three heavens. All right? We know that there's at least three heavens. Now, there could be more, but because of what's taking place here, we're going to say that this third heaven is the, the, the most that we have. 
And here's why. Notice this, verse 3. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into what? Paradise. So when we think about this third heaven, we also think of it as paradise. When Christ is on the cross and he talks to the thief, the thief recognizes who Christ is and what is Christ's response to that. He says, today you're going to be with me where? In paradise. Now where is that person? He was in paradise. All right. When we think about those things, that's, where we, that's what we have. Um, for sake of time, we won't be able to go back and take a look at what took place back there between Genesis 1, 1 and 2, 1. However, one day we will. Uh, we talked about it the last time, but <clears throat> the first heaven, if we go back and we study that out, um, this is where the birds fly. Right? That first heaven. When you, if you were able, and I can't because it's been a long time. Well, I could, but if you jump, if you jump, you're in the first heaven. Right? That's that first heaven where, where the atmosphere is that we have and all that stuff. Second heaven would be out there among the stars, the galaxies, all those, the universes, and, and things like that. When you think about those things, that's where that stuff is. And like I said, for time's sake, uh, we, won't, we won't go through that. But <clears throat> study out Genesis 1-1 to 2-1. And you can find that, that, find that out. <clears throat> um, man, I really want to do that. But for time's sake. All right. Um, but study out, study out Romans, or Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 11, 14 and 20. And you're going to find out. Um, he talks about an open heaven which is here and he talks about if that one's open then those other two would have to be closed all right um, but we know that there's multiple heavens we're told by 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that there's the third heaven and that third heaven is where paradise is and we know that's where God dwells all right um, which makes us think about what's it going to look like and that's, that's the main thing that I want to make sure that we get because if we understand what it's going to look like, then it's going to make things a little bit easier for us to see. So, here's what I want to do. Let's go over to Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> so we know that it's important to know something about the heavens. We also know that there's more than one heaven right now, that we've got the first, second, and third heaven there. We know, according to Revelation chapter 21, that there is a new heaven and a new earth, right? The order passed away. When we talk about that, what's he going to do with those heavens is he's going to take it back to the original thing where it's heaven, right? Because we, knew it, we see a new heaven and a new earth in Revelation 21. Um, but... As we go through here, we know that there's a reason why we need to know about that stuff. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what are we going to do, which is why it's important for us to know. What are we going to be doing out there in the ages to come? All right. Um, but let's take a look at this. Go to Romans chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 18. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shewed it unto them. Why is it that we can know who God is and something about God is because He's placed something within you and I to tell us that we know that there is a God and that we have responsibility to be held accountable to Him and His righteousness. That's, that's built into us, that's indwelt in us. I mean, you go out, when you think about um, before, before, before people came over to America and all that stuff, you had Native, Native Americans, right? What did they do? They have some sort of religious system, right? It doesn't matter how far out you go, every, every group of people have a, some sort of religious system because they know something within them says 
there is a God that I'm being held accountable to. Even if the most remotest places in the world, they know that there is something greater than themselves. You have to become, you have to come to a point where you actually think that you're smarter than God to be able to say that I don't believe in a God to deny inside what God put within you. And that's what a lot, that's what a lot of people do. When we go through this, notice in verse 20, he said, here's how he showed it unto them. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So when we talk about this, what's he say? There are some invisible things that God created that we can know about because there are some visible things that he created. And what they do is they tell us these visible things, tell us about the invisible things that says God is real. And we know based on Genesis 1-1 that God created in the beginning heaven and earth. All right? But there are visible things that we can see that tell us about those invisible things. And we're going to take a look at those here in a little bit later on. But notice... Um, When we talk about this first heaven being open, right, and you go back to Genesis 1, you read that, and you study that out, you find out that that first heaven is open. These other two are closed. Okay? That's just logic tells you that those other two are closed. If one of them were told is open, then the other two are closed. When we think about that, <clears throat> can we look into heaven and see God? Why? Because they're closed. It's closed, right? We can't see that. So if we can't see something, what is it? It's invisible. But if we are able to see something, it's what? Visible. So if it, what God's doing is, and this is what he's dealing with here, is he's talking about the fact that we can know some things about that invisible stuff that God's dealing with that we can't see because of the things that he's given us that are visible. We can actually see some things that's going to tell us about what's going on in that invisible realm or that, that idea. And it's not, you know, when people, people talk about, well, there's this ghost standing next to me. It's invisible to you, but that's not what I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about the fact that this is something that we can't see because it's part of that closed firmament, okay? The reason we can see the stuff here is because that's in open firmament <clears throat> okay um, go with me to Hebrews chapter 8 <clears throat> and this is this is the this is the key I think this is the key to be able to allow us to talk about being able to actually know what it's going to look like what heaven is going to look like <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1. Now the things which we have spoken, this, this is the sum... We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. So what do we find out here? There is a true tabernacle that God created, that God pitched. So there's this true tabernacle. That God pitched and not man. Keep on going. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that, the, that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. 
who serve unto the, notice, example and shadow of heavenly things. So what he's talking about is there is an example and a shadow of heavenly things. All right? <clears throat> Keep on going. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shewed to thee in the mount. So what Moses does is he creates a tabernacle here on the earth that is a, an example or a shadow of that true tabernacle and God says, here's your pattern. All right? And that's an important thing for us to know, right? Because what do we know about Paul? Paul is our pattern, right? He was set forth to be a, to be a pattern for them that should hereafter believe. And that's the issue that's going to help or that key that's going to allow us to think about these things in a, in a way that might be slightly different than we may have before. Um, I just want to real quick go back to go back to Exodus 24. I just want to show you some of this stuff, and um, I'll just, I'll just give you some verses again to kind of to study out. But Exodus 24. Start off, Exodus 24, verse 18. And if you write down Exodus 24, 18 through Exodus 28, 43, what God does is gives Moses a pattern to create the tabernacle, which is based off of the true tabernacle. So this tabernacle down here that we see is a pattern or an example or a shadow of the one that we cannot see, right? So the way that we can know what that true tabernacle looks like is why? Because God gave us a visible form of that tabernacle to understand that invisible, true tabernacle that we can't see, all right? Start off here, Exodus twenty four eighteen. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him, uh, uh, him up into the mountain. Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights. Chapter 25, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering, and this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood oil for the light spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and the breastplate and let them make me a sanctuary that I may notice dwell among them what's the purpose of this tabernacle on earth is that God would have a place to dwell with men. All right? Notice verse 9. According to all that I shew thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. And then he goes down through for the next three chapters and he's going through and he's saying, here's the pattern, here's the stuff, here's how you make it gives him the measurements and everything else and shows him exactly what it's, what it's going to do. Now there is one thing that we could talk about um, that I find quite, quite interesting is the fact that um, Brother Jordan actually does this. He takes that tabernacle and says, here's the outlay or here's the, the outline of the universe. Which, which is very interesting because you can see those things and, and how God put all that stuff together. But we also have this tabernacle that Moses is building. He has the people build this tabernacle after the pattern that God gave him. 
All right. So when we think about that stuff, <clears throat> the first thing that kind of hit me is, is you know, in, cha in chapter 25, verse 2, notice he says, speaking to the children of Israel, that they may bring an offer and bring me an offering. Notice of every man that giveth it willingly. That was the first thing that kind of hit me as I was going down through there, reading, studying through this stuff, is he's saying, of the ones that want to do it willingly, they're going to bring stuff to you if they choose to do so. It wasn't a, wasn't a tithe type of situation in this situation. He's saying the ones that are willing to bring it to you, they're going to bring you stuff and you're going to build this tabernacle. And you're going to build it according to the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments. So a few weeks ago when we had that piano up here, do you know why a piano exists? Because it's patterned after the piano in heaven. When you think about that, that's the, that's the issue of having this mindset of understanding those invisible things in heaven based on the visible things here on earth. As you go down through there, when he's talking about gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hairs and ram skins, uh, dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing, oil and, and for sweet incense, uh, onyx stones and stones to be set. Do you know why God says, I want you to get all these things and make this tabernacle? Well, if he's using that stuff to make this tabernacle and this tabernacle is a pattern after that one, then what is that one made out of? <laughs> all those things. So then what do we know about all those things? Where are they? They're in heaven. Do you know why they're here? It's because they're patterned after the ones that God created in heaven. And you think about that. Before the foundation of the world, that tabernacle and that tabernacle is already thought of. Now that's hard to grasp your mind around because you think, I can't remember past yesterday. And that's one reason why, you know, when, when we say God knows the beginning from the end, most people when they talk about that, they're, they're usually dealing with circumstances in their life. God knows what I'm going through now and He knows how it's going to end out in the end, so I'm just going to have faith in Him. But it's even greater than that. God knew what He was doing at the beginning and God knows what He's doing at the end, and He's going to accomplish His goal of being possessor of heaven and earth, the Most High God. You know, you go back to Abraham, and that's one of the titles that He gives Him is the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And we've talked about that before. One of the things, one of the I wills that Satan had was, I will be like the Most High God. His goal, one of His goals was to be the possessor of heaven and earth. So when he says that, that's what he meant. God knows what he was doing back here. God knows what he's doing out there and what he's telling us. And you go through the book of Job, and this is one thing that I've come to recently. <clears throat> All the stuff that Job's going through in the first 37 chapters, um, he's living that stuff day by day. God knew the end. God already knew what, what was going to be written in Job chapter 38. But Job didn't. And this is one of the things Brother Jordan said before. There's a lot of people living like Job 19. And you don't have to because you know Job 38. You know the answer. The answer is God's got a purpose out here for the heaven and the earth. And all we've got to do is it doesn't matter what comes our way or what issues that we have. We know that God's got that plan out there that we're going to be a part of the heavenly places whether we feel like it or not right now. And that's the issue of knowing and understanding the dispensation of grace and all the stuff that's going on is there's something out there that we're looking forward to, right? And that's the issue, okay? Now, morning. <clears throat> hey. Um, let's see. Go to Hebrews chapter 3. Boy, I'll tell you what. So... <clears throat> This idea of cutting stuff out. We're uh, we're at 35 minutes right now. I thought I cut some stuff out, but 
All right. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 3. <clears throat> Did I say Hebrews? All right. Um, hang on a second. <laughs> hang on a second. No, I, I, it's Ephesians 3. Um, I don't know why you all went to Hebrew. I did this the last time, too. Huh? I, I probably did. It, did I? I don't know. Yeah. Now, the, the, Hebrews, the Hebrews, Hebrews is in the line right above it, so that's where I got it from. So, Ephesians chapter 3. My apologies. If you just listen the first time and write down what I was thinking... That was one of the things, one of my college professors for the final, everybody was asking, what's on the final exam? He said, um, all the stuff that I gave you in notes, all the stuff that I wrote on the board, all the stuff I thought about writing on the board but didn't, all the stuff I was supposed to teach you but didn't get to teach you, that's what's on the final. I was like, man, that just... So, <clears throat> all right, Ephesians chapter 3. I went there. I don't know what... Anyway, Ephesians chapter 3. Um, and here's, here's, here's the issue with this because, you know, we understand that there's a pattern that God gave a pattern to Moses of that true tabernacle. And we can, we can know what that true tabernacle is, what it looks like because of this visible one, right? And that's the issue. Notice in Ephesians chapter 3, <clears throat> start off in verse 16. He says, well, yeah, we'll just jump in. Verse 16 that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints. Notice, what is it that he wants us to be able to comprehend? What is the breadth and the length and the depth and height and to know the love of Christ. Now, a lot of people, when they read that, they say, I want to know the breadth and length and depth and height of Christ's love. Is that what it says? No. It says, I want to know that I want you to be able to know the breadth and the length and the depth and height and to know the love of Christ. There's a bunch of stuff there that he says I want you to know about. When you think about, when you think about breadth and length and depth and height, what he's dealing with is the fact that there's this three-dimensional cube, if you want to think of it that way, that is the universe. Now, we're not in a terrarium. This isn't the Sims and all that stuff. <clears throat> I've had kids tell me that. The length and the breadth and the width and the height He's saying, I want you to be able to know some stuff about that up there based on the stuff that we see here. And also, I want you to know about the love of Christ. All right? <clears throat> and to know the love of Christ which passeth all knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. In that verses of 17, 18, and 19, you've got faith, love, and hope. All that stuff is based on knowledge. God wants us to know stuff. The reason that He gives us these visible patterns is because they're based off of those invisible things that we cannot see. Um, man. Okay. So... <clears throat> We've got some visible things that we can see that gives us an idea of what those invisible things are to be like. So, I want to skip a couple things there. The issue that I want you to make, make, you, make you see is God, God dwells in a city. God lives in a city in heaven. And we know based on Revelation 21 that John says, I see that city coming out of heaven and it comes down to the earth. Well then, if... There is a city in heaven that's going to come down and be placed on earth. Then what do we need to know about that city in heaven and that city on earth that it's going to take place of? They have to be what? Compatible. 
And that's the issue that I wanted you to see with the idea of the pattern that these things down here are just like those things up there. When God created that city that He dwells in, He also created a city that He's going to dwell in for the ages to come. And when John sees that city come down out of heaven and come down here on earth and God's dwelling there, that city that He's bringing down is compatible with this earth. All right? So what's there in heaven? So let's take a look at some things. <clears throat> um, of course we know, one of the main things we know is God's going to be there. Well, who else do we know is there? Well, we know Christ is there, right? Go to Ephesians chapter 2. We're here in Ephesians. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. If we go over to Acts, one of the things that Peter preaches is what? That Jesus Christ has been set at the right hand of God the Father and He's going to sit there until His foes are made His footstool. Well, we get over here to Ephesians chapter 2. Notice in verse 6. Here we're talking about who we were. We were dead in trespasses and sins. In chapter 2 verse 1, we were quickened. Down here in verse 6, some other things took place. Not only were we made alive in Christ, but notice in verse 6, "...and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ." In Christ Jesus. So where is Christ right now? He's in the heavenly places. Where are you and I right now positionally? We live here on earth. Where are we positionally? We're seated with Him in the heavenly places. Which is one of those reasons why it's important for us to know about those heavenly places. Not only are, is that where all of our blessings are, but that's literally where we sit right now with that position of authority with Christ because of Him. Not because we've done something to get that, but because of something that He's done, He's placed us in that seated position with Him. Some of us are already there. Some of us aren't. There might be people watching or people here. I don't know everybody's heart. Might not be saved. You're not there yet. If you're saved, do you know where you're seated? You're already seated with Him. That's how God sees you. So we know that Jesus Christ is there. We know that some of us are there. We know that some loved ones are there. Um, take a look at this. Go back to, go get Exodus 16 and Psalm 78. Exodus 16 and Psalm 78. <clears throat> Exodus 16. Uh, notice verse 4. Uh, this, is, this is dealing with the nation of Israel, the children of Israel. They, they're murmuring against Moses and Aaron because they're in the wilderness. They're like, man, we just came from Egypt. And we, had, we were beaten every day and we had to do hard work, but we always had really good food. and We're, we're out here and we're, we're in this wilderness and we're starving. Notice in verse 4. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. Now I want you to think, there's a couple of things there real quick. One, he's raining bread from where? Where's the, where's the bread coming from? Heaven. And we, we've mentioned this before. If bread's in heaven, bread doesn't just appear. Now it could, could God could just say, "Here's bread." But if there's bread, then where does bread come from? Wheats and grain, depending on what, it, however it's made, right? Well, what's that mean? That there has to be fields up there with wheat and grain. Well, what's that mean? You got to have farmers doing the work to take care of it. And just kind of let your mind think for a second. Just kind of go from there, and we'll we'll see that. The next thing I want to point out. Notice he says. 
Um, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And he's saying, I'm going to give them a certain amount every day and they need to go pick up a certain amount. And if they don't, then I know that they're not following my law. And if they do, then I know they're following my law. And I'm proving them whether or not they're doing that. All right. Psalm 78. <clears throat> we'll see if this will make this a little bit clearer maybe. <clears throat> Psalm 78. You know, it's real easy on Wednesday nights to stay under an hour, and I'm not sure why. But Sunday just, it's... All right, <clears throat> let's keep going. Not worry about the time. Let's keep going. Psalm 78. <clears throat> we'll start in verse... We'll start in verse 23. <clears throat> Though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened, notice, the doors of heaven. There's doors in heaven. And had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them the corn of heaven. Well, if there's corn coming from heaven, what's that mean? There's cornfields. Again, who's taking care of the cornfields? Now, is it again, is it possible that God just says, I just created corn? Absolutely. But what do we know down here that people plant? Corn. Do you know why we plant corn? Because it's planted up there. The visible things that we see here are patterned after the invisible things that God's created up there. The reason that, the reason that there's corn in heaven is, or the reason there's corn here is because there's corn in heaven. The reason there's wheat here that produces bread and if it's, wheat bread's really good if it's fresh. Um, but I mean, you think, if that stuff's here, the reason it's here is because it was up there first, right? Um, here, here's the next thing. Notice in verse 25, man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. So there are, you know, I would kind of see that as no. That would be a second thing maybe. It could possibly be. Um, it could possibly be meat would be the angel's food. Or it could be he sent them angel's food, or they did eat angel's food, and he sent them meat as well. It, either way, either way you can go about that. The issue is, those angels are eating, right? They have to eat too. What are they eating? Same type of stuff we do. Probably, any, probably not like McDonald's and stuff like that, but anyway. <clears throat> um, go, get, uh, go get Revelation chapter 4. You know, this is one of those this is one of those subjects that you get to have some fun with because you just let your mind think of some things uh, based on based on the doctrine that we get from God showing us the invisible things through the visible things that we can actually see that can clearly be seen. Revelation chapter four, <clears throat> notice in verse one. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Again, there's doors in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. So John sees a door opened, a door to heaven open. He goes up through there, and he goes up, and notice in verse 2, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. There's thrones in heaven. And one sat on the throne. That's, that's God the Father. Verse 3, And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. There's rainbows in heaven. There's stones in heaven. Keep on going. And round about the throne 
were four and twenty seats. There's seats in heaven. Upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. There's crowns in heaven. There's gold in heaven. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And you go down through here and you see crystal and glass and, and beasts and, and, and calves and man and eagle. You see all this stuff and you go down through there and it's an amazing thing when you, when you read through that and you see that stuff. The reason that we have all those things here on earth is because they were there first. Right? Next question that people have is, will we recognize people. Uh, go get Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. <clears throat> Start off in verse 1. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 17 verse 1. And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be, to be here, if thou wilt, let us make, make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. Now, we've mentioned this before. Had Peter, James, and John ever had the opportunity or chance to meet Moses or Elias in person? No. So when, they're, when, they're, when they see Jesus Christ transfigured before them, and they see Moses and Elias, they're like, let's make an altar for you, let's make an altar for Moses, and an altar for Elias. How would they have known what they looked like? They never knew the guys, they never met them. But when they see Moses and Elias standing with him, they say, well, let's make an altar for all three of you. Because they were able to recognize him. You know, we could go over to Luke chapter 16. When you look at Luke chapter 16, 19 through 31, you've got that... that the rich man and Lazarus, right? And we could go through that and talk about the fact that the rich man and Lazarus, they both die. Rich man goes to Hades, and or goes to hell, and then um, Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom, right? And they're able to look and see each other. And what does the rich man say? He says, Abraham, had that guy ever met Abraham before? How would he know what Abraham looked like? He knew him automatically. He says, Abraham, Father Abraham, could you have Lazarus dip his finger into the water and give me a drop of water that I might cool my tongue? So he's talking to Abraham about Lazarus. And then he says, could you send Lazarus back and... and Take him back and, and let him go back and be alive again so that he can tell my brothers about this place because I don't want them to go through that same torment. And what was, what was Abraham's reply? If you all remember, he says what? They have Moses and the prophets. Let them read them. You know what he said? Abraham says, they've got a book. God tells them in that book about this place and how to avoid it. And he says, if they don't believe that, they won't believe one that rose from the dead. And I've always said, whenever I talk about that passage, I've always said, people still don't believe about the one that rose from the dead. <clears throat> Which could be a second thing. When Christ rose from the dead, who did he talk to after he died, after he rose from the dead? Who did he give a piece of information to? Paul. What are people not believing today? a man that rose from the dead, preaching to Paul, giving him a special revelation, they're still back here. And that's the same. You could, t you could make those correlations there. All right. So are we going to be able to recognize people? And the answer is yes. Now, the last few minutes, 
man, I'm really close. <clears throat> if it's a, if it's a little over an hour, just I can't get an hour and a half. All right. Um, so let's take a look at a couple things. What are we going to be doing there? All right, because that's the thing. We know we know the patterns. We understand the, the things that we see are are based off of the pattern that God of the invisible things that God created. We know that God's going to do something in the ages to come in the heavens to glorify His Son. We know that He's going to do things in the ages to come on earth to glorify His Son, and He's going to bring those two things into one in Christ one day to be able to glorify the cross work of Christ. So the question is, well, what are we going to be doing? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 6, <clears throat> start off in verse 1. Now, what Paul's doing is he's dealing with some situations. So when he writes the book of First and Second Corinthians, it's almost as if these people have sent a list of questions. And so he's ticking off the questions in, in that list, and he says, all right, so now with this thing, and now with this thing, and now with this thing, this is what you do. Chapter 6, verse 1. Notice he says, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you know what he's saying? Do you know how to deal with, with issues in the local assembly as you take it between each other and you don't take it out in the law system to unjust people and have them rule in what you're, what you're doing in your life? You do it with, with, um, um, amongst each other. And he's going to tell us why. All right? Do you not know that the saints shall... Judge the world. And if the world shall be judged by you, and ye are unworthy to judge the smallest matters. He's like, if you can't take care of stuff in amongst yourselves with believers, and you can't trust yourself on little things, he's like, how in the world do you think you're going to be able to handle big stuff when they come along? Here's the reason why we need to know how to do this stuff. Now, here's the thing. When you talk about judge, everybody all, all of a sudden they're like, God, judge not, lest ye be not judged. And they start bringing this stuff and says, you can't judge me, only God can judge me, right? Thanks, Tupac. Anyway, <clears throat> so when you, when you think about that stuff, everybody's like, well, you can't judge me. And they say, well, you can't judge me based on how I live my lifestyle and things like that. I'm, I'm my own person and all this stuff. Judging has to do with discerning. There, 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 there is a skill that you gain through studying the Scripture to be able to discern, to be able to discern, discern. When you go over to Hebrews chapter four and it talks about the fact that God's word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder, to what? To be able to discern between soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. It divides between those things. What it's dealing with is when you get in this book, you find out how to discern whether this is a good thing, whether this is a bad thing, and the way you do that is you become equipped with what this book says. So now, notice in verse 3. You have to learn how to deal with little things in life so that you can be able to deal with the big things in life so you can discern this person that's living this life I don't agree with, and then you move on. All right? It's not, well, you shouldn't do this, you need to change your life around and all that stuff. Notice this in verse 3. Know ye not that we shall judge angels. You think about that for a second. The reason he's saying you need to get your stuff right now to be able to discern between these things now and even the smallest of matters is why. Don't you know that one day we're going to judge the angels? You know, everybody's always talking about their guardian angel these days. It's not as prevalent as it used to be. It's more of a mysticism thing that was around years ago and it was counteracting all that stuff. And this whole idea of, <clears throat> and there, I've had people say this, um, I was driving down the road and, and one of my wheels fell off, but, but when the wheel fell off, my car didn't turn down and skid and create this, Big, they're like, because my guardian angel was holding the wheel. I just, 
that's not what he's doing. Here's the thing. Everybody's talking about, well, I want my guardian angel. Why isn't he watching out for me? Why isn't he not doing this stuff? And Paul is saying, don't you know that you're going to judge the angels? Notice, how much more things that pertain to this life, if then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. He's saying, take care of, be able to take care of your issues in your life now because you're going to have to be able to judge those things for the angels. So that's one of the things that we're going to be able to do. Go over to Colossians. Get Ephesians chapter 2, or no, Ephesians chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 1. So this is... This is what it all comes down to. Alright? So we're going we're gonna to one day be able to judge angels. But notice this. Ephesians chapter 1, start off in verse 20. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. He's talking about the exceeding power and the mighty power of God. In verse 20 he says, "...which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places." Notice, far above all what? Principalities, power, might, dominion, right? <clears throat> Principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that's named. Okay. What did he do? He set Christ up here above all those things. Go over to Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 15. He's talking about Christ in verse 14 because he's talking about the, the blood that we have, the forgiveness of sins through. That's how we've got that. Verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God. Why are we able to know? Well, let's not talk about that. Let's keep, keep, keep on going. Just time's sake. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on in earth. Right? So what are the things that he's talking about? Does that mean when he says that, does he say, is he saying, well, if you go back here to Genesis 1 and you go back and you read Job, you're going to find out that God created all those things back there. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 and 16 has absolutely nothing to do with God creating the heaven and the earth because God and Paul assume you've already read Genesis 1. God and Paul already assume you've read the book of Job because by the time you've gotten over to Colossians, you should have read that by now. All right? He's saying, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, what? Visible and invisible. So it takes us back to what we were talking about earlier, right? Visible things are what's in earth. The invisible things that we can't see are the things in heaven that we can't see because that... that that is closed off from us being able to see it physically, right? Now he's going to tell us what those all things are. Whether they be, notice, thrones. So I need to put thrones in here. Or dominions, right there, from Ephesians. Or principalities, from Ephesians. Or powers, from Ephesians. And all things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. Now, <clears throat> what these things right here are, are positions 
of rank and authority. God has a government in the earth through the nation of Israel. God has a government in the heavens through the church, the body of Christ. God is going to run His government in the heaven and the earth, heavens through the nation of Israel, and, and all the things given to them, the little flock and all those folks, and He's going to run the government of the heavens through you and I. Thrones. What are thrones? When we think of thrones, they're what? It's a position of power. A, a principality. When Paul talks about the fact that we, we, we don't fight against flesh, but against principalities and powers, you know what he's talking about? He's talking about people who are in those positions of principalities and powers. Um, we're going to get one more thing after this. I want to show you something real quick. Might and dominion. And then you have every name that's named. Some of us will be in positions of rank and authority. I figure I'll probably be just one of the names that are named, and I'll be good with that. Because I'm going to be in heaven, and I'm going to be working with God, and I'm, I'm going to be dealing with things. Here's, here's the thing. When we get there to heaven, we're not going to be shocked by what we see because we see the pattern of heaven right now. We've talked about that before. The only difference now is we see this with the taint of sin. There it won't be that. And, you know, we've talked about this before. You look out how beautiful everything is. Just imagine what it's going to look like <clears throat> without sin. How beautiful some of the waters and the mountains and the trees. And, and you know, you, you drive down through Tennessee and stuff like that in the fall time and you've got all these beautiful colors in the trees and the mountains. Just imagine one day what it's going to look like without the taint of sin on it. That's what's going to be different. It's just going to be that much better. But we see these things. What are we going to be doing? We're going to have positions of rank and authority. Go with me real quick to Revelation chapter 12, and we'll, we'll finish up with this. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 12, there's some things that's taken place. With catching away of the church, the body of Christ, we meet Christ in the air. We have that beam of seed of Christ where Christ, you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and you find out it's either gold, silver, precious stones, or you've created in your life wood, hay, and stubble. And then we're going to find out through that fire, wood, hay, and stubble, we get burned up, thrown away. That doesn't mean the beam of seed, the, the, the judgment seed of Christ is not you being judged for the sins that you do on earth. God's already taken care of that on the cross. That judgment seat is where we're going to be rewarded based on what we do with that book in our hand. That's all you do. You read the book, you get it in you, and that book starts taking over and does stuff in your life. You doing something with that book and with that message is going to redound to you to either gold, silver, or precious stones. It's not your sins or anything. God's already punished your sins. He dealt with your sins on the cross. Took care of it for you. That, that judgment seat of Christ that we have, He's going to give us some things. He's going to present us to God the Father. And saying He's going to present us holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. And He's going to take us and say, this is what my cross work did. And then we're going to go and get those positions of rank and authority in the heavenly places. But there's something that has to take place first. Revelation chapter 12. <clears throat> Verse 5. I want to start here to make sure that we get this, the context. All right. Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. And she brought forth a man child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman, the woman here in the context is dealing with, it's the nation of Israel, fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that she, that they should be that sorry that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days I'm going to be able to take care of it up until about the middle part of that tribulation period three and a half weeks three and a half years 
If you go through 1260 days, it is exactly three and a half years. <clears throat> so in the middle of that, there's something that's going to take place. Verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Where is it? In heaven. If you have war, what does that mean? You have armies. You have a fight. Right? And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Notice, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Their place that they're talking about, you go over to Jude and you, you find out about their place. Their place is what? They are now principalities and powers and they're the things that we're fighting against. And what's going to take place is in the middle of that tribulation period, Michael and his angels are going to fight the dragon and his angels and take them out. And you know what they're going to do? God's going to say, here you go, body of Christ, I'm going to slip you right in. That's what's waiting on us. He's going to take those people, those angels, out of those positions of rank and authority, and He's going to take the holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His sight, church the body of Christ, who just came from the judgment seat of Christ, and He's going to take us and say, here's what I'm giving you. Go and rule my heavens. Just think of that for a second. And we get to be a part of it. To the praise and the glory of His grace. All because we're ignorant enough to take this book and build up doctrine in our soul. And we're just, we're just dumb enough to believe the words on the page. He's going to say... Look at my crown of rejoicing, Father. This is what this is what this is what my cross work did. <laughs> Look about that. It is amazing. There's really no other words to put to that. It, it's it's an unbelievable experience to think about that one day. God's not God's God's already taken care of our sins. He's taken them, thrown away, gotten rid of them all. And what it comes down to now is just get in the book, find out who you are in the book, and go live who you are in the book. And God's going to say, and you're going to one day think, well, you saved me by your grace, and it's only by your grace that I'm able to live, and you live your life through me. I didn't do anything, but you just lived your life through me. And he says, yeah, I know, that's my grace. And then, then you're going to say, yeah, but you're going to give me these rewards because I just believed your book. He's like, that's what my grace does. And he's going to say, I'm going to give you the, this position of rank and authority because of what I did through you in your life through my word because of what my son did on the cross. And you're sitting there thinking, why don't people teach this? Wouldn't it be amazing if people in all over the world in churches that are gathered right now was hearing that stuff instead of, well, you got to tithe next week. I mean, and then they'll sing when we all get to heaven and they've talked about nothing about heaven but they've talked about them on earth do you know why it's important for us to know when we all get to heaven because God's got something to do and we get to be a part of it I think that's better than last week's questions alright good deal Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we study your word. May we take the things that we've studied out today, study them out for ourselves to become more acquainted with what we're going to do in the ages to come and allow that to be the motivating factor to live the life that you've designed us to live here on earth. That we're going to be able to participate and just to be able to participate in your government in some form or fashion, but that we are ambassadors now from a foreign land that we might be able to be that proper ambassador, that we might be able to show people this is what the saying of the Most High God looks like, that we may be able to glorify your Son, Jesus Christ, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat>